hearing will come to order. Uh, good morning. Welcome, everyone, uh, to today's hearing, which is the third in a series of hearings that this subcommittee has convened on the impact of our transportation system on our environment. The first hearing addressed regulatory barriers to the utilization of green technologies that mitigate surface water runoff from our roadways and parking areas. As a result, the subcommittee reported H.R. 5161, the Green Transportation Research and Development Act in the last Congress to address that issue. Our second hearing explored the R&D agenda required to improve energy efficiency and to lessen the environmental effects of the pavements used in our transportation infrastructure. The focus of today's hearing is to examine the R&D that is required to help mitigate the impact of our transportation infrastructure on our climate. Efforts to limit the climate impact of cars and trucks stretch back to 1973 when we began to phase out lead-based additives to gasoline, although a total ban on these additives did not take effect until 1996. In 1976, the use of catalytic converters was mandated to reduce the toxic emissions of cars. In 2007, Congress adjusted CAFE standards for the first time in more than 30 years. These changes were the low-hanging fruit that helped us to begin minimizing the impact of our transportation system on our atmosphere and on climate. Even now, climate change mitigation efforts largely focus on improving our current fuel sources and developing alternative fuels. But today, there's an opportunity to think more broadly about the impact of our transportation infrastructure on the climate and environment and what research is needed to begin minimizing our impact in far more reaching ways, in more far reaching ways, I think. Uh, we need to think about improving the energy efficiency of our transportation system as a whole and not, not just the cars and trucks on it, although I do note that I think the split between the cars and the system is about 80%, 20% roughly. Uh, for example, what are the modeling tools that would help communities develop an effective mixed-use transportation system of cars, buses, light rail, trolleys, and bikes like we have in Portland, Oregon? If we are serious about congestion mitigation and traffic management, what's required to realize these goals? What tools would help us eliminate or reduce the need to commute in the first place? I want to thank our witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee and for assisting the subcommittee in formulating the R&D needs that should be included in a surface transportation R&D authorization bill. And now I'd like to recognize Representative Smith, the gentleman from Nebraska, for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today on climate-related transportation research, our second hearing on this topic as we work toward developing the R&D title of the highway bill later this spring. Appreciate the opportunity that you have taken in providing the committee an opportunity to examine uh, these issues in depth. I know it will ultimately help us craft a better bill and increase our impact on the overall highway bill as it moves forward. I also want to offer a warm welcome to doc Dr. Larry Rylett from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I appreciate your willingness uh, to appear before the subcommittee today to discuss these important issues, and I'm grateful for the quality of research you're performing at the university, and I, I thank the rest of the witnesses as well. As we discussed in our last hearing on this issue, the transportation challenges we face are significant and diverse, and there is general agreement that technological advancement is key to addressing nearly all of them, from aging infrastructure to growing congestion to ongoing safety issues. <clears throat> Part of our task then is to endeavor to ensure that the roughly $600 million in Department of Transportation research that we oversee is spent as effectively as possible. A former DOT official recommended at our last hearing that this start with development, uh, with, uh, development of an overarching transportation research agenda that establishes and aligns the key objectives and desired outcomes <clears throat> of our transportation system and then maps and prioritizes research programs to meet those objectives. This makes sense to me, and I hope to explore this route further as we do move forward. We are here this morning to discuss one potential element of such a research agenda, climate change, 
and how best to reduce CO2 emissions from the transportation system. This is obviously an area of major policy interest for President Obama and the Democrat leadership, as evidenced by the call for establishment of a cap-and-trade regime to regulate energy use across our, country, our, across our economy. I'm hesitant about a cap-and-trade policy because it would ration energy and then tax those who want to use more of it. As the President and his advisors have readily acknowledged, the proposal would increase energy prices for consumers and businesses and result in at least $600 billion in new taxes on the American people over the next 10 years. While the costs of cap and trade to our economy are clear, any environmental benefits in the form of reduced temperature growth are, are highly uncertain and may be immeasurable, especially when one considers that China and, Indi and India alone are expected to add 300 million vehicles to the roads in the next 20 years. <clears throat> While I want to be clear about my skepticism to cap and trade, I also want to be clear that I'm not opposed to supporting transportation research aimed at reducing CO2 emissions, especially when it advances additional goals such as reduced congestion or improved highway durability. However, as we consider climate-related transportation research, I think it is important to do so as part of the overarching transportation research agenda that I mentioned earlier where all research needs are systematically prioritized under department-wide transportation goals and R&D objectives. So I hope to learn more today about climate-related research needs and how they should fit into an overall transportation research agenda. Before I close, I want to comment on two specific aspects of transportation policy that relate to the topic of today's hearing. One, the notion of vehicle miles traveled based financing mechanisms to transition away from the gas tax and institute greater traffic management controls, and two, the notion of smart growth and land use planning policies to reduce traffic congestion and or urban sprawl. Both of these policies of uh, policy areas appear to be receiving strong consideration from the committees of primary jurisdiction in the House and the Senate, and both are in need of significant additional research and data collection to better inform policymakers on their respective advantages and disadvantages, especially as they relate to the social, behavioral, and economic impacts on citizens affected by such changes. For example, I'm concerned uh, that transition to a VMT-based highway tax may unfairly penalize citizens in my state of Nebraska, where people tend to drive longer distances to work and shop. Since, uh, similarly, with respect to reducing urban sprawl, I think there is a, there is a need to better understand the trade-offs associated with policies aimed at reducing urban sprawl, particularly how land use restrictions impact housing affordability and limit choice. I hope this is something we can address, and I certainly look forward to hearing from the witnesses today as to their opinion of research needs and policy trade-offs in these areas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record uh, at this point. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our witnesses today. Uh, Mr. David Matsuda is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy at the, uh, at the United States Department of Transportation, and Mr. Matsuda informs me that he has uh, been on the job for a, what feels like a very long 15 days. <laughs> Ms. Catherine Charlo is the Transportation Director at the Office of the Mayor of Portland, Oregon, and takes care of uh, my highways and byways at home. Dr. Lawrence Rylett is the Keith W. Klassmeyer, did I get that right? Thank you. The chair in the Engineering Technology uh, and the Director of the Nebraska Transportation Center at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Mr. Steve Winkleman is the Director of Transportation and Adapt Adaptation Programs at the Center for Clean Air Policy, a think tank for climate air quality policy and Mr. Mike Acott is the president of the National Asphalt Pavement Association, which is the Washington, D.C. organization representing uh, private companies and individuals involved in uh, surface, surfacing and, and pavement. Uh, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for this hearing, and when you complete your testimony, we will begin with questions each member will have five minutes uh, to question the panel. Uh, Mr. Matsuda, uh, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Wu, Ranking Member Smith, and Congressman Lujan. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss climate change research at the U.S. Department of Transportation, including 
past and current activities, and future research needs. The Obama administration considers climate change a major priority. The President is committed to aggressive action to reduce the impacts of climate change and ensure that the U.S. is a leader in the global effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The Department of Transportation will continue working with our colleagues in the administration and this subcommittee to meet these goals. The transportation sector is one of the fastest growing end use producers of greenhouse emissions. It accounts for about 30 percent of the U.S. total. There is still much to be learned about the impacts and potential mitigation strategies of emissions from the transportation sector. And the Department is taking steps to ensure we, we tackle the right issues and target the most effective actions. These steps include research on both the mitigation of these greenhouse gases as well as research into the adaptation of our transportation systems to the changing climate. DOT's Virtual Center for Climate Change and Environmental Forecasting sets priorities for most of the Department's intermodal climate change policy analysis and research. The Center is currently directing work on a report to Congress discussing the impact of the nation's transportation system on climate change and solutions to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. The report is expected to be completed mid-summer. With the subcommittee's indulgence, I'd like to briefly mention some of the research taking place at the various DOT agencies. Uh, let me begin with the Research and Innovative Technology Administration, or RETA. As you know, this agency coordinates all of the Department's research and technology efforts and oversees much of the Department's research on alternative fuels, alternative vehicles, hydrogen fuels, and fuel cells. The Federal Transit Administration continues to study public policy approaches to expand public transportation services, uh, which can greatly impact emissions. And the agency has also done work on alternative fuels and vehicles that help usher in the use of hybrid electric buses, compressed natural gas vehicles, and biodiesel buses. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, develops and sets fuel economy standards for highway vehicles. On Friday, Secretary of Transportation Ray LaHood announced that the Department has published the newest fuel economy standards for cars and light trucks for the 2011 model year. NHTSA's work on a multi-year fuel economy plan for model years after 2011 is already underway. This work sets the U.S. on a course to meet the requirement of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 for a fleet-wide fuel economy performance of at least 35 miles per gallon by the year 2020. The Federal Highway Administration is working on a number of initiatives, including setting ways to improve the efficiency of our highway and road network. The agency is also developing a framework to conduct assessments of transportation infrastructure most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. The Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, is working collaboratively with other agencies and stakeholders to gain a better scientific understanding of aviation emissions, accelerate deployment of more fuel-efficient aircraft engines, and develop alternative jet fuels. In brief, climate-related research is crucial for the transportation sector. In the short term, we need to work to identify the most effective emissions mitigation strategies. In the long term, research should focus on transformational technologies and strategies in order to make significant reductions in these emissions. In formulating its plan, the Department will continue to balance climate research needs with other environmental research concerns, such as air quality, water quality, and potential noise reduction approaches, to name a few. I look forward to working with this subcommittee. As you consider a transportation research agenda, that enables our nation to better meet the challenges presented by global climate change. Thank you again, and I'll be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Matsuda. Ms. Charlo, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Wu and members of the committee. My name is Catherine Charlo. I'm the Transportation Director for Mayor Adams in Portland. We developed these comments cooperatively with the TriMet, our transit agency, Metro, our MPO, and the Oregon Transportation and Education Consortium, which Chairman Wu was partially responsible for creating. I'd like to frame our comments today by just sharing a bit of Portland's experience. In 1993, we were the first U.S. city to adopt a comprehensive climate strategy. Since then, our per capita emissions in the city have dropped 10% below 1990 levels. 
This at a time when emissions levels nationally rose 17 percent. In the Portland region, our per capita daily vehicle miles traveled since that time have dropped 8 percent. At the same time, nationally, daily vehicle miles traveled rose 8 percent. These statistics are the result of many years of conscious planning in Portland. However, even with our successes, transportation today accounts for 40 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions in Portland. This June, we're set to update our climate action plan, and it's clear that transportation will have to be a centerpiece of that plan. Our projections show that if we're going to meet our 2050 climate goals, we'll need to reduce vehicle miles traveled by 68 percent per person below 1990 levels. No easy feat. Vehicle fuels and technology will help, but we're obviously going to need new tools as well. This is where our request to the committee regarding research comes in. We hope that you will help us achieve a transportation bill that funds climate and transportation research in two parallel and interrelated tracks. The first would address short-term early wins, recognizing that a ton of carbon reduced in 2010 is more valuable than a ton of carbon reduced later. We'd like to have you focus on the demand management and system management strategies that can reduce emissions immediately. I have a few examples of these. High occupancy vehicle or HOV lanes. Inexpensive capacity, it can be created almost overnight, reduces emissions, increases the number of people with fewer vehicles. But we need appropriate models, incentives, and decision criteria to document those emissions reductions. Another example is real-time information tools. They give users access to current information about transit and traffic conditions. We've seen these change driver behavior and increase transit use in our community. We'd like to apply them more broadly and even in innovative contexts, such as ride sharing. But again, we need funding for pilot projects and solid evaluation mechanisms. Finally, we have individual marketing campaigns, individualized marketing campaigns called Smart Trips programs in Portland. These encourage driver behavior changes and have shown a 9 to 12 percent drop in drive alone trips on a neighborhood level. We'd like to see funding and additional evaluation to make these programs stronger and to help us apply them more broadly. All three of these examples are relatively new. At this point, they tend to be judged based on traditional evaluation tools such as level of service. Those tools don't lend themselves to measuring climate change outcomes. And as a result, it's difficult to gain acceptance of these strategies and to apply them more broadly. Then over the medium term, the Portland region needs better travel data collection, modeling tools, and performance evaluation standards to help us guide capital investments. That data will help us make the case, much in the way it was described earlier, to decision makers and to the public for climate-friendly projects. Specifically, we encourage you to invest in several areas. We would like to see the Transportation Bill expand existing emissions modeling to address a wider range of vehicles, including hybrids and electric vehicles, and to address a wider range of fuels, including biofuels and ethanol. We'd like it to fund research to develop tour models that forecast trip chaining and time of day decisions in response to congestion. This would be very helpful also to help us better predict responses to variable pricing and to tolling. And we'd like to see the bill encourage and fund development of land use allocation models, which would be more sensitive to the impacts of induced demand. An example of where this would apply is in the work currently being done on the Columbia River Crossing project to link I-5 and build a bridge between Washington, re replace the bridge between Washington and Oregon. That project's current forecast models predict demand for the new bridge without addressing the possibility of induced demand tri triggered by greater freeway capacity. That has made the project vulnerable to criticism in the areas of greenhouse gas emissions and promoting sprawl. We would love to have new tools to use moving forward there. We hope the bill will fund the development of forecasting models and evaluation tools for walking and biking. We'd like to see it improve tools to assess the travel patterns of commercial and freight traffic. And 
we would like it to incent roadway pricing pilot projects to evaluate the, the effects of congestion pricing, of VMT taxes, and of variable tolling mechanisms. Finally, in addition to research on forecasting models, we need multimodal performance evaluation standards. Today's level of service standards simply don't allow for multimodal comparison of projects based on emissions goals. Again, a multimodal standard would enable us to make the case for climate-friendly projects in a way that we can't do today. We end up right now being limited to a sort of an if you build it, they will come argument in favor of non-traditional projects. Although this has in many cases been shown to be true, it's a hard sell in a competitive funding environment. So in conclusion, the Portland region has invested in high quality transportation options linked to land use policies promoting compact growth, but our ability to continue to make the progress we need to address climate change will depend on new research and tools to leverage our investments so far. We appreciate very much the opportunity to be here. We believe the transportation bill with a substantial research agenda will help pay both climate and economic dividends and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Ms. Charla. Those uh, very specific recommendations are very helpful to us. Appreciate it. Dr. Rylett, uh, please proceed. Uh, Chairman Will, Ranking Member Smith, uh, Vice Chairman Lugin, uh, other members of the subcommittee, it's my honor to participate in this hearing today and provide my views on the research in addressing climate change and transportation infrastructure. I've broken down um, my talk into, into four areas, basically, that I see uh, that that's necessary to, uh, to address. The first, uh, over the past few years, a lot of the transportation models um, have become much more simulation-based, much more individual-based, where we're looking at tours, we're looking at uh, activities. Uh, this is a fantastic development, but they haven't gone far enough in terms of what we're looking at here, in terms of being able to make these trade-offs. The second relationship is to the emission models themselves that, that these transportation models feed. They're very average, they're very aggregate, but the end result is that a lot of projects that we get asked to look at, demand, demand management, pricing, it's almost impossible for us to use these models to answer the questions that we're being asked. Uh, and, and we would certainly like to see uh, research directed at making these models much more disaggregate so that we can make these kinds of trade-offs. Uh, uh, in terms of congestion management, congestion relief projects. Uh, the second issue that we see as very important uh, is related to the, to the data, not surprisingly. Uh, part of the reason that the models are, are, are not as, as good as they could be is that we don't have a lot of, of information that, to feed those models. And again, that comes in two forms. Uh, the first is in real time uh, data on activities and how the driving, uh, uh, driving behavior uh, with the advent of intelligent transportation systems, we have a lot of data out there. In fact, it's easy to show we have terabytes of data. Even in Nebraska, we can collect terabytes of data uh, every month. Uh, the, the reality is, though, that a lot of that, that data is not very useful in terms of the information that we need. And so a lot of work needs to be done on, on collecting that data, putting it into usable form, and then allowing the modelers to access that data, not only for developing these models and calibrating them and validating but also to, to, to measure whether, the, whether these um, policies that we're putting into, into effect are really uh, uh, achieving their goals. The other aspect of that, uh, to the data, is that a lot of work, because we're interested not only in averages now, but also in, in distributions. Where, for example, if you're looking at pollution, the idea of, of the average is nice, but really you're looking at the, the outliers, hard accelerations, hard decelerations, old vehicles, those types of things. Uh, the data has to be much more uh, uh, robust in the sense of looking at the distribution of, of events. And, and because of that, our, our standard statistical models that we've been using in the past probably won't apply for this new, uh, new level. Uh, the, third, the third issue that, that was identified um, was it really encouraged the, the research to be multidisciplinary enough um, uh, so that the impacts can be understood by the uh, decision makers. Um, and again, this gets back to the idea of, of not only looking at, you know, it's, it's fine to look at one issue, but so much of our work Im impacts each other that not only do we have to look at the environment, but also the impacts on safety, the impacts on, on other aspects of the transportation system. 
because a lot of our policies tend to uh, tend to um, interact with each other. For example, uh, the, the one I put in my written testimony uh, related to the fact that we're asking drivers to rest more for safety reasons, which is a is a is a very good thing. But also at the same time, we're asking them to idle less for the environment, which then impacts their ability to do safety. Uh, that's just one anecdote. But again, being able to look at these types of pro these complex problems at a system level would be very advantageous. The the other aspect of that I'd like to point out is that there's a lot of uh, of um, because of the uh, multidisciplinary nature, nature, there's a lot of uh, advantages to pursuing public-private partnerships where they make sense. Uh, a classic one to me would be the uh, reducing emissions related to logistics industry. They have very good data on operations. They know where their vehicles are. They know where their freight is. They can do lots of good things in terms of the environment, in terms of rerouting and that, um, rerouting their freight, moving it at different aspects. But again, that. That would involve a, a very good, strong partnership, and I think there's a um, there's a lot of potential for that. Uh, <clears throat> the fourth issue is sort of an over, overarching issue related to the uh, to what I would call sustainability, and that gets again back to this idea that these problems are fairly complex, and we really need to look at them from all aspects. That in itself is a research topic. How do you how do you go out and measure whether these initiatives are actually doing what they're doing? How do, you, how do you get the, the data back to the decision makers so they can make rational decisions based on all these competing objectives? Uh, and I would encourage the committee to think about that in terms of, of their research agendas. Um, and my concluding remarks, again, very similar. I wanted to go over those, those four issues of, of uh, modeling data, uh, private-public partnerships, and, and sustainability. Uh, I'm obviously very biased. I'm a director of a UTC, uh, but I think because of the complexity of the of these issues, uh, the universities have a, a lot to offer. They're not only getting educating the next generation of students, but getting students to work on problems that might not have a solution in the next year or the next two years, but 10 years or 15 years from now, which is really what we're talking about. This is a, a very good environment for that. I appreciate the opportunity to give my thoughts, and I'd be happy to address any questions that you have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roilette. Um And uh, please give my best to uh, Coach Osborne. Um, we miss him here, but uh, I think he's a far, far better place. Uh, Mr. Winkleman, please proceed. Chairman Wu, Ranking Member Smith, and Mr. Lugin, good morning. My name is Steve Winkleman. I'm the director of the Transportation Program at the Center for Clean Air Policy, also called CCAP, a Washington, D.C. and Brussels-based environmental think tank. CCAP helps governments at all levels design and implement climate policies that balance economic and environmental concerns. We conduct technical analyses and facilitate dialogue among stakeholders in government, industry, and environmental groups in the U.S. and worldwide to craft practical and effective solutions. CCAP encourages our partners to ask the climate question, how will infrastructure and land use decisions affect greenhouse gas emissions and vulnerability to climate change impacts? Congress is poised to spend $500 billion on transportation infrastructure. Asking the climate question about that investment poses new challenges that transportation officials are not equipped to address. CCAP has seen firsthand the hunger that federal, state, and local officials have for the missing data and tools needed to address climate change. Implementation of the ambitious research agenda that I propose would have major benefits beyond climate policy. I believe it would provide a solid foundation for a performance-based approach to transportation policy, grounded in verifiable facts and accountability for outcomes. Research is needed on the following topics. One, assess the costs and benefits of emission reductions. Two, expand research on improving travel choices such as transit, walking, and telecommuting. Three, measure performance of transportation investments. Four, improve data and models and five, plan for adapting transportation infrastructure to the impacts of climate change. I will highlight priority research opportunities and offer more detail in my written testimony. First, the Transportation Research Board, the Department of Transportation, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Department of Energy should collaboratively conduct the first ever comprehensive study to assess the costs, benefits, and co-benefits of greenhouse gas emission reduction measures, including vehicles, fuels, improved travel choices, travel demand management, and system efficiency. Second, 
Congress and federal agencies should treat research on improving travel choices as seriously as R&D on efficient vehicles and fuels. We'll need it all for climate protection. While we marvel at the scientists inventing the next generation of batteries and hybrids, we should also support the visionary planners, architects, and economists doing the R&D to invent healthy communities and more walkable and bikeable neighborhoods. The empirical evidence shows that residents of walkable neighborhoods emit less CO2 than those of car-dependent neighborhoods, even if that car is a Toyota Prius, which is why I like to say that sidewalks are as sexy as hybrids. We should therefore fund smart growth planning as applied R&D, which can have significant payoffs. For example, the Sacramento region spent some $4 million on smart growth planning and discovered more than $9 billion of infrastructure savings while reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 14%. In Portland, investment, $70 million investment in streetcars helped attract more than $2 billion in private development. Third, Congress should require greenhouse gas measurement for major transportation projects and programs. Federal, state, and local agencies will need new resources for performance measurement so that they face what I call a funded responsibility and not an unfunded mandate. Fourth, accurate travel data critically needed, is critically needed to evaluate transportation system performance. Transportation experts have identified major deficiencies in the reliability of, and completeness of travel data and key travel surveys have lost federal funding in recent years. Working with our high-level dialogue participants, CCAP has developed a set of travel data recommendations, which I include in my written testimony. We call for TRB to conduct and study and develop, conduct a study and develop recommendations on the highest priority data and modeling improvements needed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we ask Congress to provide funding for the study and for implementation of its findings. Specific improvement opportunities <clears throat> include collection of odometer data, electronic data collection, and advanced travel models that can address non-motorized travel, freight, and pricing strategies. Finally, CCAP recommends establishment of research and technical assistance networks to adapt transportation infrastructure, planning, and operations to climate change impacts. We still have a chance to stave off the worst impacts of global climate change if we act swiftly and thoughtfully to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. By asking the climate question about the pending $500 billion investment, Congress can make sure that transportation is part of the solution and not the problem. The research agenda I propose would allow us to plan and invest wisely and reap dividends measured in economic efficiency, energy security, and healthy communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winkleman. Mr. Acott. Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, subcommittee. I very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, chat with you this morning. Uh, very pleased to report to you that we are on the verge of several major breakthroughs uh, in the area of asphalt pavement technology, which, with your help, uh, we think are, are going to be transformative. Uh, the reason why it's so important is the sheer scale of asphalt pavement infrastructure. Uh, of the 2.6 million miles of paved road in the United States, over 94% of those roads are surfaced with asphalt. Approximately 85% of the nation's airfield pavements and parking lots are also surfaced with this material. Uh, because of the sheer extensive use of this material, uh, small changes in technology will make a big difference in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I would like to touch on two such technologies and the research needed to accelerate deployment. Uh, my written testimony uh, actually uh, discusses four technologies, warm mix, uh, recycling, perpetual pavement, and porous asphalt. Uh, however, I'm going to focus on the first two because they've created, uh, quite frankly, is an unprecedented interest in the amount of interest from our stakeholder partners. If you look at a cross-section of asphalt, and I'm showing a cross-section of asphalt here, uh, you can actually see the crushed stone particles of various sizes. Uh, these are held together with a mortar of asphalt, cement, or glue, and fine particles. Uh, these uh, materials are combined in the mixing facility. Uh, they're dried, and they're mixed with the asphalt binder, which is the black glue. Uh, typically, the composition of asphalt is about 5% asphalt cement and about 95% stone, sand, and gravel. How the material is manufactured, the ingredients used in the mix are key to understanding uh, what the opportunities are for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. 
Uh, the first very exciting technology for us is warm mix asphalt. A warm mix asphalt allows for the production and placement of asphalt pavement uh, tech, uh, materials at much lower temperatures than conventional technologies. Running warm mix can reduce energy consumption during the manufacture of asphalt pavement by an average of 20 percent. Uh, this would equate to about a million tons reduction in greenhouse gases. Uh, so far, implementation of warm mix has proceeded with virtually no complications. Uh, we do that in partnership with the state DOTs, the Federal Highway Administration, EPA, NIOSH, and our labor union partners. Uh, warm mix also makes it possible for us to increase the rate of recycling or reuse of asphalt pavement. Uh, research on this topic could be very helpful in speeding the rate of acceptance. Uh, research funding would also be needed for emission studies and for also monitoring the long-term performance. The second very exciting technology is uh, recycling. Uh, the use of reclaimed asphalt pavement has been widespread for about 30 years. Uh, asphalt pavement is America's most re reused or recycled material. Every year we recycle more than 100 million tons of asphalt pavement uh, is reclaimed and recycled. Virtually all of it is recycled back into asphalt pavement. A singular quality of asphalt pavement is that you can actually uh, restore and rejuvenate the asphalt binder in the pavement. You can actually bring it back and replace it one for month uh, for uh, conventional virgin asphalt cement. In other words, it becomes an integral part of the binder. Uh, this is referred to the highest and best use. Uh, no other pavement material has u this unique quality. In view of the high reuse recycling rates in many states, and the evidence of very good performance of recycled pavement, uh, we believe that there's great opportunity for double the quantity of uh, recycled material within a five-year period. For asphalt pavement, it is possible to reduce greenhouse gas emissions simply by incorporating recycled asphalt pavement in new pavement. Currently, the average recycling rate is about 12 percent in asphalt. Uh, we believe that this could be doubled and it will save about two million tons annually. Uh, we also estimate that we have about 18 billion tons of asphalt pavement already in place on America's roads and highways, and because of the ability to reuse and recycle this material indefinitely, our existing highways are a resource for future generations. <clears throat> in closing, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, NARPA recommends in the next Surface Transportation Bill uh, that we should include an asphalt pavement research and accelerated deployment program uh, this program should be focused on the four core areas described in my testimony, uh, warm mix, recycling, perpetual pavement, and porous asphalt. Uh, we believe that it should be led by the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, this program should bring together all of the stakeholders from government, industry, academia, labor unions, EPA, uh, to work on these core topics. We also recommend a very modest $10 million per year for this program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with this investment, within the next five years, uh, I believe you will see full deployment of warm mix. Uh, you will see much higher rates of recycling. You will see the development and application of perpetual pavement technologies, and you will see much more extensive use of porous asphalt technologies. All of these will lead to a substantial reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental and economic benefits. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Acott. And at this point, we will open for our first round of questions, and the chair recognizes himself uh, for five minutes. Uh, I'd like to open with a layman's question. Um, Mr. Winkleman, Ms. Charlo, you both refer to the reduction for the need to commute. Um, how much uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions that we've seen uh, in places where such reductions have been achieved, what percentage would you allocate to uh, reductions in the need to commute or elimination of the need to commute versus uh, all other sources combined, such as more efficient vehicles, um, uh, better use of materials, et cetera? Uh, thank you for the question. I think looking back is different than looking forward because over the past couple of decades, there hasn't been major improvement in vehicle efficiency. There's been great technology improvements that's gone into sort of increased weight and power. So where we've seen reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, 
Um, some of the biggest benefits then are from uh, increased travel choices, improved accessibility that allows for walk trips and shorter drive trips. In fact, the research on smart growth is interesting that the majority of the reductions come from shorter vehicle trips. So it's not about getting everyone out of the car, it's having things closer together and more accessible. If we look forward over the coming decades, I agree that we'll see the majority of reductions coming from uh, vehicles uh, and fuels uh, and that there are major opportunities uh, on the uh, travel demand side of improving choices. So Mr. Win Winkleman, looking back, virtually all of the gains have been from reduction of the need to travel. I would say for greenhouse gases, the majority are. For air pollution, it's been the other way around. Technology uh, and fuels have done it. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. Uh, looking at Portland's experience, I mentioned earlier that since 1996, we've seen an 8% reduction in vehicle miles traveled and a 10% reduction in mm -hmm. uh, emissions over 1990 levels at a time when those things were both going up nationwide. Uh, I can share a few more statistics with you. Since that time, as Portland has developed our system, which includes a streetcar system, an expanding light rail network, 200 miles of bikeways, um, we have seen a number of developments that parallel those decreases in vehicle miles traveled and emissions. One of the interesting overall developments is that throughout the Portland region, not just in the central city, uh, work trips have generally re been reduced in length by 33%. Now that really speaks to what you were talking about, the smart growth elements paying the kinds of emissions and trip reduction dividends that it's hard to quantify and that we would like to have tools to quantify moving forward. Um, we've also seen since, uh, since 1991, so it dates back a little bit earlier, an increase in the bike mode share from around two or three percent of trips into downtown Portland to around 10 or 12 percent of trips into downtown Portland now. Again, we don't have a, a solid way of measuring the emissions reductions here, but we see that in the overall numbers that I talked about early in my testimony. And then uh, in terms of transit, since 1990, we've had a 16% population increase in Portland, and we've had a 46% increase in the use of transit. So that's, that's another one of those examples where we've provided the system, we've built out the system, we've really made it usable for people, and we have a very high transit use because of it. We don't have great um, emissions tracking figures, but we see it in that aggregate total. Is that helpful? It, it is. I mean, what it begins to look like, is it, it's very parallel to what Mr. Winkleman said, that in the rearview mirror, uh, if you will, that m m perhaps all the gains can be attributable to getting people out of their cars or turning their cars off uh, and using some other mode of transportation, and one hopes for a different mix of savings going forward. That's right. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much. I'm getting close to my time limit. I'd like to recognize the ranking member of this committee, the gentleman from Nebraska, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Charlo, I, I'm very intrigued by uh, your testimony and, and I guess uh, commend the efforts of, of the city in, in reducing emissions and so forth. I think the, your, your numbers are very compelling. Given, I mean, it, I hear you saying that it's uh, more consumer choices uh, in, in transportation that have led to these things. How do you think we could address, in, in rural areas, um, I mean, it's very difficult to provide all those choices, obviously, if not impossible. How, how do you recommend we adopt policy or fashion policy that reflects the flexibility that's that's necessary. I mean, in urban areas, we use tax dollars to reduce traffic in some senses, and in, in rural areas, we use tax dollars to increase traffic uh, given economics and, and various things. How, how would you suggest we address that? That's a good question. I work in a city, and so I'm not going to have great answers for you. Um, I, I think you you look to places 
that have tackled the questions of transportation in rural areas. Um, there, there's actually been amazing work done in other countries where they, they use transit in ways to truly link rural communities in a more usable way than we've been able to do here. So I think looking to a system like Switzerland where they link all of the villages with buses and trains um, and their mail delivery service, ideas like that, it's definitely worth looking into. I think also looking at some of the, the strategies that you mentioned in your opening remarks, looking at ways to price trips so that the, the price of those trips, possibly a vehicle miles traveled pricing structure, weighs into people's decisions about the kinds of transportation they use. And I guess the, the last piece of that, which is an important piece, is looking at the, the sort of jobs housing mix, how people get to their jobs, how they get to the daily activities that they need to do when they live in rural areas. Um, that being said, I would, I would invite Mr. Winkleman as well, who I think has done a little more work in the rural areas to sure. comment. Please. Thank you. Um, I think, first of all, in rural areas, we're going to see the biggest greenhouse gas reduction opportunities from um, technology on fuel. So you might say, you know, subways for cities and green pickup trucks for rural areas. I mean, in terms of where the opportunities lie in terms of the previous question. That said, if we look at the traditional sort of rural village with mom and pop shops, that was a walkable kind of place. So to the extent that you're attracting new development, if that's done in a way um, where there is uh, walkability, um, especially as fuel, if fuel prices go back up and driving 20 miles to that discount center may not be so affordable um, when, you ha when you face higher costs. Also, the notion of telecommuting. Now, obviously, if you're, if you're working on a farm, that's not going to work. But for those jobs or those errands where purchases can be done online, then broadband-type technologies can help facilitate those trips, which reduce the need uh, to, uh, uh, to travel. Finally, um, intermodal freight options, while uh, applying both to urban and rural areas, can look at improving the overall uh, system efficiency so that you are uh, minimizing emissions on it may be more from uh, the freight side than the passenger side. Okay, if you might also uh, tell us, does the CCAP support the Transportation Financing Commission's recommendation uh, to transition away from the fuel tax to a VMT-based system? And uh, wouldn't such a transition reduce current incentives uh, to buy fuel-efficient vehicles? Well, we don't support any particular funding mechanism except that, to note that we're going to need to uh, fund this. And looking at it as an investment, that's why we look at the broader sort of economic picture. So you're not looking just narrowly at dollar per ton or just narrowly at, you know, how are we going to stick it to the taxpayers and, and raise this money, you're not going to. But if you say this is an investment and this is how we're growing our economy and you're doing that kind of research and analysis to say, as, as you mentioned in your comments, let's look across research needs, let's figure out which measures both advance environment um, and economy, um, then you can find out which pricing mechanisms uh, make sense. We're going to need to pay to maintain the infrastructure we have and to grow um, in, a, in a thoughtful way. That money will need to come from somewhere. It's probably gas tax uh, or VMT tax. Um, so, you know, wh whichever one it is, if it's fuel tax, we're going to see uh, reduced um, uh, revenues because of imp improved fuel economy. That's why people are looking at pricing. I think looking at the synergies, are you able to collect information about system management that the kind of data, whether it's fuel or vehicle mile travel data, uh, will, will be beneficial for? So looking at those multiple benefits, I think, will lead to the answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, the gentleman from New Mexico. Thank you. Five minutes. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Winkleman, uh, you, you state that the transportation community has recently awoken to the dangers of climate change and now has to make up ground. Uh, what do you attribute this delay to? I think um, from my earlier comments, if we look at the tremendous progress in vehicle technology uh, and fuels, made a huge difference uh, in air quality. And so there was a sense and the sort of mission of transportation uh, departments to uh, focus on um, congestion of specific facilities and focusing on the roadways. Um, there were efforts in many places like 
Portland or Arlington successful on sort of improving travel uh, choices, but they never really had to deal with the demand side in the same way that we have to here. My calculations show that even if we have 55 mile per gallon vehicles, CAFE standards in 2030, and 15% cut in fuel greenhouse gas uh, emissions, we'll still be well above uh, where we need to for greenhouse gas reductions. So we need to look at improving those, uh, those travel choices. And it's basically, it's why I talk about sort of a funded responsibility. If we're gonna be asking agencies to do something they've never really done to really focus uh, uh, strongly on improving travel choices, they're gonna need new resources and policy uh, to support it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Atka, uh, according to your testimony, total emissions from asphalt operations decreased by 97% from 1970 to 1999. Uh, what led to the large decrease, and is there still room for improvement in this area? Yeah, the emissions uh, we're discussing here are primarily the, what comes out the stacks of our plants. And um, uh, throughout that period, uh, there was... Um, uh, rapid uh, deployment of all sorts of techniques to reduce um, uh, 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 emissions. These included uh, bag houses, uh, scrubbers, and various activities. So uh, it was a it was a very significant drop. Um, uh, what we have found is what's left can pretty much be uh, pretty much taken away by uh, deploying warm mix. If um, if you go to uh, any uh, paving site or any uh, uh, manufacturing facility uh, running Warmex, um, uh, I think it would be f very hard to detect any emissions or odor around uh, these uh, facilities. So um, uh, for us, uh, Warmex is very exciting in terms of uh, having a manufacturing s uh, facility actually set up within a community. So uh, I think uh, the initial um, the reduction is uh, what we call end of pipe technology. You're dealing with it afterwards. Uh, what Warmix does is actually uh, control emissions at the source. And um, uh, in fact, I think there would be significant savings in terms of uh, some of the hardware and equipment that one would have in, a, in an asphalt facility uh, as a result of controlling emissions at the source. And how could that uh, research be accelerated? Um, I, I think it's uh, going at an incredible rate. Um, I mean, I really believe uh, the whole industry will shift to uh, warm mix uh, within a five-year period, uh, which is uh, really unheard of. Um, and I think uh, with your encouragement, uh, some of the uh, studies that are needed uh, just to make sure the material is performing as well as uh, conventional, everything that we have seen, all the accelerated testing, uh, all the experiences in the field have been very, very positive. Um, so um, uh, what, just to make sure that we are going to get uh, pavements that perform as well as conventional uh, material, um, and also some work on the actual emission reductions themselves, I think, would be, uh, be very helpful. But um, uh, I would be very confident that just looking at the rate of deployment, that within a very short period of time, uh, we could get 100% deployment. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, in closing, just a, a bit of an observation. As I read through the testimony of each of the witnesses today, the, you know, it was interesting to see that there is um, uh, something that seems to be repeated uh, by each of the witnesses today. The need for more research, the need for more data, um, the need to be able to look at different ways of doing things. Um, we, we refer to this as green transportation infrastructure. I would refer to this as smarter. Uh, innovative, um, improved infrastructure in the way that we're going to be approaching this. And, Mr. Chairman, I would just like to remind the committees a piece of legislation that um, uh, was moved forward through the committee, which you're very familiar with, uh, which is H.R. 5161, the Green Transportation Infrastructure Research and Technology Transfer Act. If that would have been adopted and moved forward, it would have done exactly what we're hearing from the witnesses today that needs to be done more research, be, being able to be smarter and moving forward and accelerating the type of research that's needed to be able to accomplish the goals that we've heard today, Mr. Chairman. So it's good to see that the committee's on top of that, Mr. Chairman. Hopefully we'll be able to see that legislation move forward so that we can uh, be on top of this as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Luhan. And uh, uh, I find your analysis uh, not only insightful, but uh, something I agree with uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. And let me follow up on your question. Uh, as many of the witnesses alluded to either gaps in research 
or different kinds of data that need to be collected in order to uh, improve what we can do and um, uh, even in, more importantly, perhaps in planning going forward what we want to do. Uh, I'd like you, you to, dr to address those data needs uh, uh, more uh, going forward. You have each discussed them somewhat, but I'd like to encourage each of the witnesses to discuss that. And, and for those who can, and please try to put it in the context of some of the transportation research agencies like uh, the Center for Climate Change, I, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, yeah, the DOT Center for Climate Change, uh, RITA, and some of the other uh, research entities uh, that, that we have uh, currently existing. Uh, whoever would like to start, uh, just uh, Mr. Acott. Mr. Chairman, in, in our view, one of the, uh, the missing gaps is that there really isn't a very good model to uh, actually evaluate uh, in the paving material area um, uh, greenhouse gas uh, contributions in terms of throughout the full life cycle of the, uh, the pavement. And I think uh, when you're looking at uh, carbon footprint, you've got to include the actual carbon generated during the raw material acquisition. So in the case of, for example, asphalt, you've, look, you've got to look at the actual asphalt cement uh, manufactured in the refinery, taking it all the way out uh, to the, the full life of the pavement. In the case of uh, cement, uh, you've, you've got to look at both the energy consumption and also the carbon dioxide uh, generated during the processing part of cement. And then you take that all the way out, you look at the 50-year uh, life of the pavement, you've got to take into account the maintenance cycles, the rehabilitation cycles. So I think what is missing is a, an acceptable model that characterizes a pavement throughout its full uh, life cycle. There's no current baseline for, for that material. Uh, <clears throat> that material. Some, I think there's been isolated work uh, done throughout the world, um, but I would say there is no accepted uh, US-based uh, uh, methodology. Um, uh, ISO uh, uh, standards uh, has a model. Uh, I think National Institute for uh, NIST has a model but I, I think a model for pavement materials that includes uh, all of the various components would be very, very helpful. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Mr. Winkleman. Well, as my written testimony goes on and on, there are a lot of uh, opportunities there. A couple that come to mind um, is for uh, the Department of Transportation, and presumably this could be RITA and BTS, um, looking at how uh, transportation money has been spent in, say, different regions of the country across modes, how much in highway, how much in repair, how much transit, travel demand management, and compare that to sort of VMT and greenhouse gas emissions to sort of understand the diversity of what's working in different places. We'd expect different things in different places, but we haven't actually looked at how the money is spent and how that maps with uh, greenhouse gas performance. Uh, Yep. To, to continue to take a regional approach uh, to uh, research, that research done in different regions uh, will give, uh, will have different orientation and, and, and have uh, results that are sort of differentially valued within the, the regions. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, a region that's more metropolitan or a region that's more urban, you're going to expect different solutions and different outcomes and understanding um, and just doing that measurement of the history of how the money was spent and what came out of it would be, would be important. Also, just looking at uh, alternative uh, information sources, looking at fuel sales. There had been an effort between FHWA and the IRS to look at fuel sales and try to map that to specific locations. Those sorts of collaborations across agencies are key because sometimes you find some incestuous in the data sets, someone's calculating fuel economy on someone else's travel data and someone else's fuel use data. And that corroboration, getting data on vehicle use, on fuel sales from multiple agencies uh, will be really important. I think there's a strong role uh, for uh, BTS there. And then the kind of guidance on how do we measure these reductions, what do we expect from them, uh, I think is needs to tap the expertise of both the department, although working in collaboration with other agencies to understand uh, what you can save and what you can cost, and then how you actually go about and implement this. Because in some ways people know what to do, but they don't necessarily, what's the next step if I want to improve travel choices, or if I want to uh, uh, increase uh, bike mode share, for example. So that those sorts of technical guidance based on the sort of research that we've recommended would be, uh, would be quite valuable. 
Dr. Wylett. Uh, just uh, uh, we, uh, going off of what I said earlier, I think that some of the, the major issues are uh, getting data on activities. Uh, you know, we we're talking about transportation, but the reality is we do tra we have transportation because activities are going, economic activities, work, uh, shopping, those types of things, and we really don't have good databases on those aspects. And this is critical for some of the questions that were being asked. Um, I'll, I'll give an anecdote. I, I ride my bike to work. I still have to go shopping. If I, wrote, if I took my car, I would go shopping on the way home. So some of the benefits that you might uh, immediately assess as this is a good thing might not be as great. And, and there's, all, there's obviously ones that, that go the other way. But I guess the point is there's not a lot of good activity-based knowledge out there. And, and again, that feeds into the activity-based no models that we require to, uh, to, to answer some of these questions. Uh, related to that is uh, the traffic data again. We have very good, we have lots of traffic data, but not in, in the form that's, uh, that's usable. We have a lot of averages, not a lot of distributions, uh, not a lot of individual uh, uh, information such as uh, driving profiles. A big gap on the traffic side is on the freight. Uh, you know, Congressman Smith was talking about the, the, the differences between areas. There are parts in Nebraska that on the highway, 60, 70 percent of the traffic is freight, which is completely opposite to a lot of the metropolitan areas. Understanding that, and there are parts of Nebraska that uh, are the Midwest, in our small towns, we'll get 140 trains a day. This is a, this is a, a large amount of, of freight traffic, and that's what our center is set up to, to analyze. But my point is that there's not a lot of information on the freight uh, movements, and then, and obviously they have a lot of impact. Uh, if you can move some of the freight away, you'll, get, you'll reduce some of the congestion in your urban environments. So that kind of information is missing. Obviously, that would be on the US DOT side. And that information goes into both the models that we're, we've been talking about as well as the analysis. Can we really identify that the policies we're putting into place are actually doing what we anticipated? I'd also like to make the point or uh, the differentiate between data and information. We have a lot of data, but a lot of you know, what we're really looking at is information. This gets back to the sustainability uh, topic. Um, are we getting the metrics that we really need to, that we that we want to analyze? We've had talks about HOV uh, HOV lanes. A lot of our data is in vehicle miles of travel. Maybe what we're really interested in is person miles, or you know, how many people are we moving per mile versus how many cars are we moving per mile? I think that's a very common one that we teach. But there are other components of that that certainly. Uh, could benefit from uh, other research. Uh, on the other side is the, uh, from a modeling perspective on the emissions, um, we don't have a lot of good emissions data. We have a lot of average data that we put into models and we say, yeah, this, we run the model and we say this is what's going on. But if you're looking for a source of, uh, of real-time emissions from actual vehicles, there's almost none of that out there. We've done some work on uh, portable emission measurement devices. I think there's a lot of potential for that. But really getting in and looking at the drive cycles, um, you know, how many hard accelerations, how many uh, hard decelerations, that's where the, you know, the, the, they have a, all other things being equal, they have a lot of greater impact on the environment than, than just the normal driving cycle. That would be from the EPA side of things. And again, getting back to my earlier testimony, being able to integrate those two uh, is critical. So thank you. In my testimony, I talked about some specific modeling and evaluation tools. Um, we've heard some great ideas about where those might live. Uh, I think that we've seen great success with the sort of collaborative entities like the Oregon Transportation and Education Consortium that has been put together to deal with some of those questions locally or in the context of, for example, cities. Um, so modeling and evaluation tools around walking, biking, trip chaining, I think those kinds of things would live well in that type of environment, that type of research environment. At, at Portland State University, there's a number of different institutes that address these questions, and I think with additional funding and additional um, sort of research structure, they could they and universities like them around the country could really move forward with some of this. Um, I, I think a particularly important piece of that are models that address that land use and transportation 
relationship. And that's, those are obviously going to live in these multidisciplinary, multi-jurisdictional kinds of entities. And then I, I want to just mention again the importance of uh, some sort of a more widely accepted multimodal performance-based evaluation standard. Um, and that's obviously going to need to come up through FHWA, through some of the other federal entities to be accepted um, as something that really can be used to evaluate performance on highways and roadways throughout the country. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. I think the key is to really try and understand what the transportation needs are of uh, the end users of the system. Uh, the, the Obama administration has an opportunity to revisit uh, the, the approach taken to uh, d determining how we can uh, how we can determine how our transportation systems can be made much more efficient, uh, and that includes things like examining behavioral changes uh, and the potential for uh, reduced vehicle miles traveled. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll be working with a uh, in a comprehensive manner uh, to take a collaborative approach. And as uh, Secretary LaHood has indicated, that any uh, proposal on the reauthorization will include sustainability as a major theme of it. So, uh, Mr. Matsuda, as a veteran of, uh, as a 15-day veteran of uh, <laughs> your current post, uh, uh, what I take you to be saying is that uh, uh, to the extent that these uh, research needs are not being met currently, you are uh, open to suggestion for their incorporation in some meaningful way in the future. Absolutely, and we will uh, certainly consider the, uh, the the views of this subcommittee as uh, as one uh, being very interested in it. Well, we are all grateful for that generous response. Uh, the ranking member, Mr. Smith, five minutes. Thank you. It, it's very interesting to try to uh, piece together various perspectives here, and I appreciate your willingness uh, to think ahead and and really prepare for the future. I think in so many cases we underestimate that or how in many of these cases it's good business. It, it's better economic uh, utilization of our resources and, and our assets uh, that boils down to it's good business uh, to stretch our resources further. I, I think of you know, how, how much a, a farmer works to reduce consumption of fuel uh, with no other concerns than economic, perhaps, but yet it's a good thing to reduce that. I mean, the, the uh, byproducts uh, of the impacts on the environment are, are great, uh, and I could go on down the list. Um, so it, it makes folks uh, very nervous when perhaps there might be some policies based on absent technology that will drive up the cost uh, drive down profits at very, very tedious times economically. I, I don't need to uh, tell anyone that. Um, in in uh, uh, Mr. Matsuda, your testimony highlights the President's call for the cap and trade uh, to reduce CO2 emissions 80 percent by 2050. How, how do you think the, those costs, I mean, it's very clear based on the budget, proposal, it's very clear those costs do exist. How do you think those will be absorbed by consumers? Uh, well, I, I do reference the, uh, the cap trade proposal in the uh, testimony today. We understand that uh, technology, uh, we expect to play a major role in helping to uh, uh, promulgate some of the efficiencies that are really needed to, re to make these reductions. Um, uh, but uh, that's uh, primarily what, what we're looking at. Technology uh, that's yet to be a, uh, accessible to the common consumer or, I mean, a... a uh, well, we hope that the work of the subcommittee in determining uh, what research really needs to be done to gain those efficiencies can, uh, can help play a role there. So, I mean, there, the timeline for the cap-and-trade proposal is, I guess, what I would say is rather aggressive. Uh, are, are we ready for it? Uh, I, I'm certain that it's, it's something that 
uh, the administration takes very seriously and, and views as, uh, as doable. The, uh, the cap and trade? Yes. Proposed. And, and when do you think that is doable? Uh, I'm not sure I'm qualified to speak on that. Okay. But I can, I can check and get back to you if it pleases the subcommittee. Sure. Well, I, I appreciate that. And um, I think that, you know, when you talk about biofuels, I mean, uh, it, Ms. Charlo, I, you referenced biofuels a, a bit in your uh, testimony as well. I think they're, it, it's inspiring to know what uh, some of our options are out there and how various sectors of our economy, geographically or otherwise, I can contribute to the solutions, and uh, so I, I think there's a lot of hope, and I, I hope that we can use as many market-based approaches as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, I'd like to uh, approach perhaps the final round of questions. Uh, uh, there, there are a lot of other questions and concerns which um, the panel, the subcommittee has, and uh, we will be submitting a number of questions to you all uh, in writing. Um, a number of the witnesses referred to performance-based approaches. And um, I'd, I'd like to understand that a little bit further and also just sp focus in specifically on what the metrics of performance-based standards are. Uh, uh, do they currently exist? And if not, who would develop them? Um, how quickly do you think we can develop them if they don't currently exist? Uh, and um, uh, and if and how their availability would affect transportation policy? Some of you have referred to some of those topics, but uh, let me open that up to the entire panel and then uh, just hear your comments on this topic. Mr. Winkleman, first off, the high dive. Never shy. The, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, in CCAP's dialogue on transportation and climate policy, we have a number of the leading stakeholders um, in transportation and have been looking at the issue of performance metrics. In fact, those work group discussions led to the need for having the improved data so that you actually have something meaningful to, uh, to measure and, and evaluate. We think it's important that the metrics address multiple issues uh, at once. If we care about 10 issues in the transportation bill, for example, and we're going to measure all 10 of them, none of them is going to carry significant weight to uh, really make a difference in terms of policy uh, and spending. And so I think that if you look at some simple metrics that are practical and measurable on greenhouse gases, you could look at greenhouse gas per capita, for example, uh, for a region. To get down below that, you might want to say, what is vehicle miles traveled uh, per capita? What is the fuel economy uh, in that region? In order to not just measure, but to figure out how to respond to that and look for the overlaps. We've seen with higher fuel prices and then uh, um, the reduced driving, uh, driving levels, we've seen lower uh, accident rates, fewer car crashes. So if we are reducing energy use, reducing greenhouse gases, improving safety, reducing uh, wear and tear, uh, then we've got something that addresses multiple things uh, at once. So looking for those overlaps will be key. So you can look at greenhouse gas per capita, crashes per capita, for example, uh, on the safety front. But importantly, looking at those uh, overlaps across metrics will be important for making them practical. Uh, Dr. Rylett, Ms. Charla, we're counting on you all to uh, come up with the metrics that we're looking for. And Mr. Matsuda, we're counting on you to uh, tell us uh, which part of uh, your agency are, are going to solve those problems. Um, I'm not going to be able to offer you the metrics, but I want to give you a, a situation where we could use them, which may be useful uh, as Dr. Rylett answers that. As we work on the Columbia River Crossing project, which I mentioned in my testimony, which is the I-5 bridge between Portland and Vancouver, we're looking at replacing an existing freeway bridge with a much larger freeway bridge that also has a transit component, a light rail component. And one of the things that Mayor Adams has done is spearhead a bi-state effort to create what we call a mobility council that will provide performance-based management of this new bridge over time. That was important to both communities because the, the Portland side of the bridge feels very concerned about some of the environmental impacts, the possibility of induced travel, the possibility of greater congestion, 
and the Vancouver side feels very concerned about having free flow of travel and both sides feel very concerned about freight being able to move through the corridor and not ending up in 10 years or 15 years in the situation where we are now where freight is completely captured by just single occupancy vehicles. It's freight can't move through the corridor. So in trying to come up with long-term performance-based goals, we have this mobility council that will be looking at what are our desires, what are our needs in terms of emissions, what are our needs in terms of freight mobility, what are our needs in terms of um, induced demand, how is it actually playing out as we've added this additional capacity, and then we'll, our, our desires to be able to use a combination of tolling and transit and possibly HOV lanes and van pools, other strategies like that, to manage the demand over time. But where we are right now is in the process of developing those metrics, and it would be very helpful to not have to create those from scratch and to have better tools to kind of measure and work toward those. Uh, I, I get you about uh, what the need is. Uh, what do you need to measure? We need to measure how, for example, uh, the additional capacity affects the number of vehicles moving through, and then in turn, the how those additional vehicles affect the greenhouse gas emission levels. So it's pretty basic information, but it's not being gathered now. What we need are tools and strategies to gather that information. Okay, and, and it sounds to me like under what you phrase as primary data, there, there are actually a bunch of different measurements to, tr to try to get at those numbers. I think that goes to Mr. Winkleman's point that a lot of those measures are going to be interrelated. That especially when you have facilities, as we do more and more, that have transit pieces, but also have highway pieces. Or where you're measuring for different outcomes. You're measuring for greenhouse gas emissions outcomes, but you're also wanting to move freight through the corridor. Well, you may have a specific, uh, a, a specific measure that might help both of those things would be a speed and reliability measure. If you could move if you had a speed and reliability measure for freight moving at 45 miles an hour through the corridor, that may get to both those things that you want. But again, we need, we need more work on that. And, and maybe Dr. Rylett will be able to help us with some of the yes, specifics. I, I, I can give you lots of no, practical I, questions, I, but I'm I mean, looking to him to help us with no, this. This is very helpful, theory. and I'd like Dr. Rylett and Mr. Matsuda to take a pass at this uh, before we, before we uh, uh, perhaps move on and close up, but I, I just want to comment that uh, th there, there, there's a lot of soaring rhetoric, and, uh, and when it's not soaring rhetoric, there's a lot of hand-waving that goes on uh, in this town. And after oh, five years as either uh, ranking member or chair of this subcommittee, uh, and, and I think this is my inclination way before I came here in the first place, uh, I've been kind of a nuts and bolts kind of person. And, uh, uh, you know, I want to know what the it is uh, that we're going to measure, uh, how much it's going to cost, uh, who it's going to cost, you know, what the downstream impacts are, and so on and so forth. And um, we're not as strong on, on that in this institution either. So, Mr. Matsuda, you shouldn't feel badly about this. Uh, it's just that uh, I, I, I know the phenomena of which I am asking about uh, in, in this instance. Dr. Rylett, please proceed. I think the uh, it's a very valuable question. I think the the results or the other comments are are I'll just jump off those. Uh, you're asking a professor a direct question, and that's always sort of dangerous. And I'll be the first to admit that. You know, we always need more oh, research. Oh, listen, I, I, this you're 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 <laughs> on this side of the uh, on this side of the microphone. Um, you're 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 looking at a lawyer who's asking a question to who, to which he does not know the answer which is also a, a, a very dangerous <laughs> thing to do. But I, I will point out some, uh, some things. A lot of what we want to measure really comes down to, to the decision makers, which would be the politicians who, who represent the people. And, and that's what I teach in my classes. And that's when we talk, when I have my issue on sustainability, you know, what is important, that's what we want to measure. Is it, is it reducing, and, and again, I'll get back to Mr. Winkleman's comment on that they're interrelated. In my comments, I made the point about um, reducing uh, nitrous oxides. We've, and I've heard this from the trucking industry, where they've brought in the new fuel efficient, or sorry, the new um, the new engines that are going to reduce nitrous oxides. Um, they also have the tendency to reduce fuel 
fuel mileage, uh, which is where I, what I hear from the trucking industry and, and their worries about that. And obviously those two measures are in conflict. If you're talking about reducing fuel efficiency, you're increasing uh, uh, greenhouse gases, but you're also doing something nice on the other side. Um, so again, I'll get back to the, to the point that it, what you measure needs to be comprehensive. It has to be, uh, by definition, measurable. A lot of the things we want to know, we cannot get. And I mentioned that in my earlier comments on the uh, freight comment on the freight on the freight data. But I would I would just say on this on the sustainability, getting the input from the from the decision makers. I'm I'm going to take the the typical professor's approach and say further research, because it really comes down to saying, can we measure it? Where do we get it? Is it the important things that the decision makers really want? Is it, is it going to allow them to make the decisions? And again, I'll get back to this, to the trade-offs. What are, you know, you, the decision makers have to make decisions regarding, you know, do we put money into safety? Do we put it into the environment? Do we put it into congestion relief? Sometimes they're, they all go the same direction and sometimes they don't. That can, uh, I'm, I cannot answer that right now, but I can see where, those types of things, those types of questions are valid research and important research that would help uh, not only the committees, uh, this committee, but also local and state governments as well. Well, thank you for that answer, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rylett. Uh, you know, we were debating up here. I didn't want to ask the question without knowing the answer, and um, finally I had to, and you're saying further research is needed, uh, and that's something I can understand. Mr. Matsuda. Uh, thank you, Chairman. As you mentioned, that's uh, uh, the key question is what, what do we need to measure? And, uh, you know, given that the department really does have a multifaceted mission, uh, it becomes a complex question because we need to measure, uh, you know, any things that impact or the deci decisions we make will impact both the mobility or safety uh, or environmental stewardship factors. Uh, I, as I mentioned, the, this administration, you will likely see a renewed focus on the environmental stewardship portion uh, of its mission, uh, but a lot of what we're able to do is really determined by the resources uh, that are given to the, to the various programs that will study climate change research. Very good, Mr. Matsuda. We're going from policy to data needs, and now you put it back in my lap. You can't get the data unless you have more money. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, five minutes. If, if I might, uh, Mr. Matsuda, try to draw this to a close. How would you say DOT sets the transportation research priorities across the agencies and the programs it, can you, it, as concisely as possible? Well, currently we have uh, uh, an internal committee that collaborates among amongst the different agencies to determine what the research agenda is going to be. Uh, and that's something that, again, the, the new administration would like to, to revisit and, and uh, be able to uh, implement its own priorities uh, within that agenda. So it is something that is coordinated uh, to, the, to the extent possible. So what would you say are the objectives driving, driving that? Uh, the, you mean what, what kind of object, uh, priorities are we looking at for this administration? Right. Uh, well, I, I think I mentioned that definitely environmental stewardship is, and sustainability is something that we're going to see uh, a major uh, you know, focus on within the next uh, reauthorization. There's been a number of uh, factors that the Secretary has mentioned as well, uh, livability for one, uh, you know, and, and mobility is something that's, uh, that's key to uh, obviously keeping our economy going and making sure that uh, folks get where they need to go and have the jobs to do so. So mobility along with the sustainability and and other, uh, okay. Um, at our last hearing, we heard DOT's former RITA administrator recommend that uh, DOT should develop the uh, an overarching research agenda. Um, do you agree with that recommendation? Uh, I, well, it's... <laughs> I, I believe that witness had a, a unique perspective, having served in the in the prior administration. Uh, I would offer that I, I think that perspective is also driven by some of the, uh, I guess, perceived frustration. I perceive that, that someone in that role must feel, and that uh, the, the agency, Rita, has the 
uh, role of coordinating all of the department's uh, research and technology efforts. However, they don't really have the budget authority to do so. Uh, they don't, you know, much of, uh, I'd say of, of about 40, for instance, in, uh, in the climate research arena, about $41 million was spent in FY08. Uh, about two-thirds of it was uh, earmarked or for specific projects, uh, and the rest of it, you know, uh, goes to the various agencies themselves to determine. So it, it makes it difficult to uh, really draw up uh, some overarching priorities and, and on things you want to focus. That's something that this administration uh, wants to take a look at. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I certainly uh, admire your willingness to uh, take on, uh, I think, some very important issues. And I'm just merely talking about uh, sustainability and mobility in the same conversation, I think, reflects what we're up against. I mean, there are, there, uh, we need good policies that, you know, I, I appreciate forward thinking policies. Uh, it gets frustrating on this end when uh, there, we might have some policies in place that are based on wishful thinking. Uh, you know, I, I would love for various parts uh, of our economy to be more efficient as it relates to uh, um, energy consumption. Uh, when that technology isn't quite ready, it's not ready. And until such time, uh, we need to understand that. Otherwise, I, I have a feeling that we will uh, cut corners in, in various respects. I mean, I, I can think of, of some safety issues that would likely come up uh, that will be huge challenges if we are encouraging uh, too many people to ride in a vehicle, perhaps, uh, that the uh, number of people exceeds the number of seat belts. And, I mean, that's just uh, uh, one, one approach that I think we need to be very careful of. But um, again, I appreciate uh, everyone's willingness uh, to be here today, but Mr. Matsuda, to, uh, to take on the, uh, the bureaucracy <laughs> And uh, I, I admire uh, your, your public service. So uh, thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The uh, gentleman from uh, New Mexico. Uh, Mr. Chairman, two, two questions. <coughs> Mr. Matsuda, you uh, also mentioned uh, with Rita conducting advanced vehicle uh, technology research, emission testing, performance evaluation of advanced uh, diesel engines, battery research, hydrogen fuel cell technology. How's DOT coordinating their efforts with um, uh, DOE and, and with EPA to be able to move forward with with some of these important approaches. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, DOT does participate in a number of intergovernmental uh, organizations that help coordinate the uh, uh, the research that goes on. To, and the idea is not to duplicate research, but to make sure that uh, the resources are used effectively and that. Uh, you know, we can get the most out of, of the efforts that we're doing. Um, I can get you the names of the specific groups if, if you like. I can get back to you with those. And with, with your familiarity over the last, you know, a few days that you um, uh, have had the, the great fortune of taking on this immense responsibility, um, do you see, you know, the opportunity and the hope really behind implementing a lot of uh, what's already been uh, looked at and we can move forward to accomplish some of the goals of the administration? Well, I think so. I think there's a, a lot that's already out there uh, in terms of lessons learned and things that work. Uh, for example, in the city of Portland is probably a very good example of, of what can be accomplished uh, for, for a city of that size. And, and there's, uh, there's going to be differences across the various regions. Uh, you know, as, as Ranking Member Smith mentioned, the rural areas have unique challenges. I believe about a third of all VMT is created in, in rural areas, and so that's something that we can't really ignore. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, there's there's definitely uh, things that we know now that we can be using to, to help implement uh, future policies. One may be uh, modal shifts, for example, uh, you know, a, a renewed focus on transit uh, spending might influence uh, people's behavior. Or, uh, uh, for instance, if there's if there is availability to take uh, a bus or rail service, uh, folks might be more willing to do it if, if good service is available, and, and that is, you know, has uh, some positive effects on, on greenhouse emissions. Yeah. No, thank you. And you know, with that being said, Mr. Metsuda, I, I represent a rural district as well, 16 counties, 
that runs from the state of Arizona to the state of Texas across the Colorado border. Uh, furthest point for me to get across the district takes eight hours in a car from one tip uh, in the southwestern part of my district to the northeastern part of my district. But one thing that's happening out there is we're seeing a lot of coordination with some of the local uh, transportation districts and moving together to take advantage of a light rail system that was built in New Mexico. They're bringing in buses. They're being smart about the types of fuels that they're using. They're coordinating efforts now throughout the region, recognizing that the largest impact is coming from passenger and light truck um, of people having to get to work. Um, and so if we can target, you know, in this area where we can mitigate and be smarter about the way that we're going to move people, I think we can have some significant gains. And Mr. Akat, my the last question that I have is around the importance of what's happening uh, with water, water runoff. And going back to, again to the technology, what you've been talking about, um, this is another area that the committee reviewed, uh, it's my understanding, um, last year as well or during the 110th Congress. Uh, moving forward with some of the, the technology, uh, the different ways of utilizing um, asphalt and the way that we're going to be paving our vehicles or paving our roads, I apologize for that. Um, would that help address some of the concerns with what some of the runoff and replenishing uh, 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 with some of the concerns with, uh, uh, you know, big cities where, you know, they're having to pay increased fines for runoff and people are being smarter about the way that they're taking this into account? Yeah, the uh, the opportunity with uh, the, um, uh, runoff is, is really threefold. One is uh, to just use an open graded material in the surface and that would uh, cut back on splash and spray and the water just permeates through the mix and then runs out the side. Uh, the, the next step is to, to build a completely porous uh, pavement structure where the water, rather than having retention basins and, and, and also uh, reducing the rate of runoff, the speed of runoff and the erosion, is to actually use the, the pavement itself as, as really a, a, a retention basin. Most of that work has been done uh, used in parking lots, parking areas, uh, but there is a very notable exception in, in Oregon, actually. Uh, Pringle, Pringle Creek is a community where all of the highways within that community is, is made from uh, completely porous pavement. So a very interesting development would be, can we actually make our highways porous? Could they be linear water treatment facilities where perhaps you have porous at the edge of the pavement, the water runs off, runs through the shoulder material and you're actually using the, the pavement itself as a retention basin. So I think there is a lot of opportunity for, for doing some, some very solid uh, civil engineering work in, in that area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bluhan, for your uh, contributions to the subcommittee. I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, Unfortunately, it feels like we've just scratched the surface of many of the topics that we've opened up. Uh, I also, on the other hand, feel that uh, uh, this hearing has gone on a little bit longer than I originally intended it for. It's been very, very productive, and I thank the witnesses for pointing out um, a significant number of data and information needs uh, which can inform the policymaking process uh, going forward. Uh, we will be submitting a number of written questions to, to all of you. Um, and I'd like to uh, close up by uh, uh, making some general comments, and I would, uh, I would invite uh, Mr. Smith to respond if, if, he, if he wishes to, that um, we, we face some great challenges going forward in this particular topic area and in, in many other arenas uh, in this Congress. Um, as someone who, now I've taken a lot of criticism from my young and eager staff, for example, for alluding to climate change as a theory. And I point out to them that evolution is a theory, that relativity is a theory, and so on and so forth. Uh, electricity is a theory. I've never seen it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I am sufficiently convinced uh, by the data thus far that the risks of doing nothing are sufficiently dire uh, to take the risk of doing something, recognizing that there are significant risks in doing something. Um, in doing something, um, there's a significant possibility that we might not get things right uh, the first time, 
that things need to be improved as time goes on. Um, no major reform in our society that I can think of has happened without bipartisan support. And I think, I personally think that that is very, very important. Um, if there's significant opposition to doing something on this, then of course there's the political risk that we calculate in this town all the time about one side or the other gaining a substantial number of seats in the next election and so on and so forth. And uh, that's a calculation that goes on all the time in this town about any major policy decision. I think that as public leaders, what we need to do also is to stand back. And I think this is true of the economy currently, and this may be true of the climate change issue also, whether there is a broader responsibility uh, at this particular point in time to try to come together on, from, from both sides to address issues that are of such magnitude that if we don't come up with a consensus response, that may not be what everybody wants, but to effectively address either the economy or the climate change issue, where the consequences will be so dire for the nation and for the world, that it's not just the moral equivalent of war, but it really is the equivalent of war, uh, that uh, one bad path could lead to the extinction of our economy, and another bad path potentially leads to um, the form of civilization as we've organized it since the Industrial Revolution. And um, these are serious consequences that I think we will be trying to address in the coming months. And um, I hope that we will be able to find uh, not just the data solutions to some of these issues, but also um, a gathering consensus uh, based on the data and a, a willingness to come together on on, um, on some of these issues. Having been in the minority and now in the majority, I certainly understand the, the, um, the impetus to, uh, to, to draw distinctions. Uh, but th there may be some issues where it is uh, increasingly dangerous for either side to try to draw those distinctions instead of um, coming together on it. And uh, it, uh, Mr. Smith, if you'd like to comment, you're certainly uh, welcome to. Um, I'm ready to close up. Well, I, I appreciate that, and, and I certainly want to uh, offer uh, my, th my uh, willingness to, uh, to work together. Uh, you know, I'm with you on the uh, theory of, of climate change, uh, but it, it's more than that. When I've heard uh, over the last uh, few months uh, various measures being taken that have never been taken before in an effort to, I think, in good faith, do good things for our economy, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, we should, you know, take such drastic measures perhaps, uh, especially in, in light of the fact that we, we know that <laughs> there will be cause and effect or there will be some, some consequences to some things. It, I mean, that, that's pretty clear. And it's not just transportation and the costs associated uh, with with um, a heavy hand of government, but it's production not only of crops in Nebraska, but a manufacturing across the country. And so that's why I, I hope that we can uh, move very judiciously and not over aggressively uh, in, in the name of many things, and not just our economy, not just uh, being good stewards of our environment, but uh, all of the moving parts of our uh, society. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. I think that one of the most challenging things to do is to try to, if you will, go where no man has gone before and also move judiciously at the same time. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Appreciate it very much. We will be following up with a good number of uh, written questions, uh, particularly about the Bureau of Statistics at DOT. The record uh, will remain open for additional statements from the members, um, and uh, we, we will be asking a significant number of additional questions. I thank the witnesses again, and uh, the witnesses are excused, and the hearing is now adjourned.